Bigger by Patricia Calvert. Page 1 Before. On July 4, 1865, four months after the end of the Civil War, several hundred men gathered along the banks of the Rio Grande near Eagle Pass, Texas. These men, led by General Joseph O. Shelby, commander of the Iron Cavalry Brigade from Missouri, had never surrendered to the Union forces. They vowed they never would. One of the soldiers held the stars and bars aloft, the symbol of Confederate dreams. After he had lowered it and spread it on the ground, General Shelby threw down the black plume he had worn in his hat band throughout the war. The flag was wrapped around a stone. Then stone, flag, and plume were pitched into the muddy waters of the Rio Grande, where they sank out of sight as a lone bugle sounded taps. It had taken the troops 29 days to cross the Texas Plains. Now they planned to route across the river and escape into Mexico. There, with the help of Emperor Maximilian, they hoped to rearm themselves to eventually retrace their steps across the border and restore the Confederacy to the glory they believed it deserved. The day was hot. The men were tired. Many wore tattered Confederate uniforms. Others were dressed in threadbare civilian clothing. Yet the spirits of these men were high. They were bound together by a deep conviction regarding the principles of the four-year conflict they had fought and lost. Now they were prepared to leave behind parents, wives, children, farms, homesteads, businesses to cast off old defeats and take up a new dream. The quest they shared was an irresistible magnet that drew them across the wide brown river that flowed below. Page 3, Chapter 1 Tyler lifted a pale green bean tendril and coaxed it around the wooden arm of the trellis there. He had finished all four rows of pole beans. He straightened and rubbed the hollow of his back it was sore. Tonight he'd have to sleep on his side, his knees tucked up, to give himself a little ease. Tomorrow, though, he'd tackle the potatoes that still needed healing. Then the whole garden would have been tended to. Peas, po beans, potatoes, squash, turnips. The corn in the field behind the house, high on the slope where it got plenty of sun, was already six inches tall. It would be a good year for crops, the best in the four long years since Papa rode away. The boy shaded his eyes, squinting against the evening sun, glad the day was almost over. He could see that Mama was already had already lit the lamp in the kitchen. He hoped she was making biscuits for supper. He'd eat several slathering, each with gleaming brown ribbons of sorghum. The cow had came fresh a week ago. Mama and Rosalie had churned this morning so there'd even be butter on the table tonight. Tyler turned when he heard the sound of a horse crossing the narrow bridge over Sweet Creek. It was rare that anyone traveled up or down the road anymore. When Papa was home, of course, visitors came as regularly as bees making their rounds. Folks for miles in each direction had craved the company of Black Jack Bohannon. The boy looked hard at the rider. Suddenly, he couldn't breathe. His heart refused to beat. Then he sucked the warm evening air deep into his lungs. The moment was unfolding exactly as he had dreamed it would. A month ago, on Palm Sunday, April 9, 1865, General Lee had surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox, over in Virginia, and the long war had ended. And now, now at last, Papa was home. Tyler watched as the rider came slowly up the lane, his heart swollen and tender with happiness. A moment later, though, a vague unease settled on him. Papa certainly hadn't written, ridden away like that, had he? Shoulders hunched, chin resting on his chest as if he were in prayer. No, 
He'd gone off high-headed and proud, his big red horse as eager to be off to war as he was himself. Doubt kept the boy from running to the fence and calling Papa's name, as he'd done in all his dreams. Papa! Oh, Papa! We've waited so long. But Tyler knew the war had done awful things to people. Maybe to Papa, too. Why hadn't it killed Oat Snip's brother and many others, although these soft Missouri hills, no matter whether they fought on the side of the Union, like Billy Snap, or with the men in gray, like Papa. Oat's family got a letter bordered in black from Mr. Lincoln. Oat carried it to school, then hung red-eyed on to a tree in the schoolyard while Mr. Blackburn read it aloud to everyone. Tyler could still hear the schoolmaster's voice, solemn on the morning air, while Oat hugged the tree as if he believed sooner or later it would hug him back. Oat's brother had fallen at Stones River. It was a name that had a pleasing sound. As Mr. Blackburn read, Tyler imagined a place where clear water ran over smooth black and gray boulders and found it hard to believe that's where Billy Snap did his dying. Tyler walked to the fence. The top rail was level with his breastbone and he pressed against it hard to keep his heart quiet. The rider came closer. Finally, he lifted his head out of the lavender shadow cast by his hat brim. Tyler stared. His heart returned to its familiar, shriveled size. The stranger's beard was as thin and pale as corn silk, not as thick and dark as a beaver's pelt. His eyes were as gray as his uniform, not as black as a gypsy's, and there were blue puddles of weariness beneath them. When he finally spoke, his voice was as light and soft as air. Papa's had been as rich and thick as molasses. Evening, son. Evening, Tyler replied, then added cautiously, Sir, you live close by? The stranger wanted to know. There was a deadness in his voice that made Tyler think of ashes in a cold grate on a chilly winter morning. Up there, Tyler said, dropping his own voice to a whisper. He pointed up the hill toward the house, whose kitchen window now glowed cheerfully in the falling blue dark of May. Reckon your mom and daddy could spare a tired traveler a meal and a bed for the night? The man asked. He did not refer to himself as a soldier, Tyler noticed. Might be they could, Tyler answered. He decided it would be best not to mention that Papa hadn't come home from the war yet himself. Maybe you could ask them for me, the stranger suggested. Yes, sir, Tyler agreed, stepping away from the fence. I'll surely do that. I'll wait here. The stranger offered, crossing his hands on the scarred pommel of his saddle. I don't want to cause a fuss for anyone in case there's no food or any room to spare, he murmured. For all of us, this war has been. The soldier hesitated and seemed to search his mind for the right words to describe what the ordeal had been like. It had been, it had been hard on everyone, north and south, blue and gray, black and white. It left many of us, ah, so much different than we ever thought we'd be, he concluded. So softly, Tyler could barely hear him. Tyler nodded as if he understood how that could be. None of Papa's letters made the war sound quite like the stranger just did, though. I'll come right back, he promised. Papa, my father, he got back a week ago and went to fetch a bull calf from a farm over yonder. He'll likely be late getting home for supper tonight. It was a lie, of course, but Tyler decided maybe it was a necessary one. He studied the stranger for a moment longer. Papa being late and all, might be my mama could let you have his portion, he offered, elaborating on the fib just a bit. Tyler glanced back once as he ran up the hill. The stranger waited in the road, 
head lowered again onto his breastbone, his horse with its eyes closed too, as if they were once more offering evening prayers. In the darkness, the blooming dogwood on the opposite side of the road looked look like mist rising off the creek. The man wasn't Papa, which after four long years was a terrible disappointment, but his uniform was gray, which meant he might have ridden with General Shelby's Iron Cavalry Brigade, too, and maybe several warm biscuits and sorghum. After Mama had poured him a second cup of strong black coffee, the stranger might have news to share. He might even be able to tell them what had happened to Papa. Because I have to know, Tyler declared softly as he stepped onto the porch. He reached for the latch on the kitchen door. Even if it's like Mama always says, that Papa most likely is dead, that we'd have heard something from him by now if he wasn't. I still have to know. If your father was Black Jack Bohannon, a man who fit his name like few other men fit theirs, and if you were his oldest son, you couldn't let yourself rest easy until you'd found out what his fate had been.